Let us worship God and sing praise to his name in Psalm 118. Psalm 118, singing from verse 24 to 29, the last four stanzas of the psalm. 118 from verse 24. This is the day God made. In it we'll joy triumphantly. Save now, I pray thee, Lord. I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he in God's great name that cometh us to save. We from the house which to the Lord pertains, you blessed have. God is the Lord who unto us hath made light to arise. Bind ye unto the altar's horns with cords the sacrifice. Thou art my God. I'll thee exalt. My God, I will thee praise. Give thanks to God, for he is good. His mercy lasts always. Psalm 118. Closing stands are twenty four to twenty nine. This is the day God made in it. We'll joy triumphantly. Sit now, I pray, thee, Lord, I pray. Send our prosperity. Blessed is he in God's great name that cometh us to save. We from the which to the Lord pertains you blessed up. God is the Lord who unto us hath made light to our eyes. Bind ye unto the altar's horns with cords of sacrifice. Thou art my God, I'll exalt my God. I will praise. Give thanks to God, for he is good. His mercy lasts always. Let us come now before God in prayer. Let us stand up. Ah, we thank Thee, our God, that there is this cause to rejoice before Thee, that we can sing of Thy grace and of Thy mercy, we can seek to exalt the name of the Lord, for He has done wonderful things, things that star our souls, that shame our sins, that bring the angels to rejoicing. Things that transform lives from death to life. How marvelous is our Savior. How great is his name. How triumphant is his salvation and complete. How utterly without flaw, without error, without shortfall, without excess, how sufficient for all things. And, O oh Lord, we pray that we might, as it were, be given that spiritual nerve, courage, to put this heavenly redemption to the test in our own lives, that we would 
lay the weight of our never dying souls upon it and find it is strong that we are building our house not upon the sand but upon a rock a rock that is immovable a rock that has stood to the ferocity of all the temptations and assaults of hell a rock that has beaten back as it were even all the outpourings of the fury of the wrath of God against sin. How we thank thee for Jesus Christ and him crucified. How needy we are of such a saviour. How, O Lord, as we look through this world, this veil of tears, there is no one else to help. There's no one else who can do this for us. There's no one else who can pardon us our sins there's no one else who can reconcile us to God there's no one else who can give us life that never ends there's no one else who can deliver us from hell there's no one else who can welcome us into heaven there's no one else who can be a friend that sticks closer than a brother there's no one else who can be a brother born for adversity and oh we thank thee for the magnificent perfection of our saviour we thank thee, Lord, for the steadfastness of his salvation. And pray that thou be with us this evening again as we gather ourselves around the foot of the cross, as we come to see Jesus, as we come to hear about the crucifixion of the Savior, as we come to hear tell of the gospel. Oh, that thou wouldst give us ears to hear, now, we might not have itching ears wanting to be tickled, but rather a heart that is thirsty and yearning, that thou would give us cries in the depths of our soul, groanings that cannot be uttered. Give us, Lord, we pray thee, a panting and a braying as the heart, as the deer by the waters, waiting to be filled with the water of life, satisfied with nothing less. Give us, Lord, we pray thee tonight, an outpouring of hunger. Give us, O oh Lord, we pray thee, the thirst of the dying man. Give us, Lord, we pray thee, the cry of the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me, and thou comest into thy kingdom. Remember me. Oh, that thou wouldst Take away the many obstacles that lie specially rooted within our own souls. Take away unbelief and take away pride. Take away, O oh Lord, we ask thee, that inertia and stubbornness and resistance and lethargy. Take away the ignorance, take away the sleepiness, take away the distractions. Take away, O oh Lord, that postponing of dealing with the things of our soul. Take away that preference we have had for the things of this world that are passing and fleeting and empty that might be sweet upon the lips but are bitter in the stomach. Take away everything, O oh Lord, but a single-minded, wholehearted need for Thee. And show us thus, as hungry, desperate souls, something of the fullness of Christ, the suitability of the Savior. Show us, O oh Lord, we pray thee, the accomplishment of the cross. Show us, O oh Lord, the love of Jesus. Show us the willingness of the Savior. Show us the sufficiency of that redemption wrought by him. Show us, O oh Lord, we pray thee, how what he has done only he could do. Grant us then to be, as it were, binding with cords to the horns of the altar, the sacrifice of Christ for ourselves. That we would commit ourselves to him and him alone, be bound to him. That as he is, so will be, so will we be. As he died to sin, so must we die. And as he rose again, so must we live. And as he's ascended up on high, so will we ascend up on high. 
And all what I did will be when we leave behind the sins and the miseries of this world. When we see him face to face. When we shall be like him. Or we shall see him as he is. And we shall join in the throng of 10,000 times 10,000 of the saints and thousands of thousands. When we have the harmonies of angels rejoining the praise of the Savior. I remember then those who need thee this evening amongst us. Remember, O oh Lord, those who are lost. Oh, that thou wouldst bring to mind all that we heard in recent days. Remember, Lord, we pray thee to add blessing to blessing over our communion season, that where there was a stirrings in the hearts of sinners under the gospel, where there was a recognition of the applicability of the message that we heard of the prodigal son, he was lost that that would not be stifled any longer, that it might not be restrained or constrained within the bosom of a soul, that it might not be suppressed by wicked will, but that it might be given liberty to cry out, what must I do to be saved? Or oh, that we might seek Christ and be found. That he would lay us on his shoulders. And call together his friends and say rejoice with me. For I have found that which was lost. Pray for those who are struggling in heart and soul. Those, O oh Lord, who are tempted to give it all up. To feel that either a profession has been a sham or that their seeking of the Lord will never be heard or that there is too many obstacles in front of them. Let none of Satan's lies stand in the light of the gospel. May the shadows flee away. Remember those, O oh Lord, who have burdens to bear we know not of. Those for whom this day itself is a trial. Who are anxious over loved ones. Who are anxious over their own state, bodily or soul-wise. Pray for them. Pray for those, Lord, who are themselves ill, suffering. Who are perhaps even dying. Oh, that thou wouldst prepare the dying for death. That thou would prepare the living for sorrow. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst be with those who are suffering greatly, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We pray for peace in the war torn parts of our world where there is conflict O oh Lord we think not only of Ukraine but especially of Ukraine think also of the Middle East think Lord of the constant violence in Israel and in Palestine Oh, Lord, they are a sheep not having a shepherd. Do thou take Jew and Gentile and break down the middle wall of partition between them, which nothing but the gospel can do. Remember our missionary endeavors. Remember them, O oh Lord, we pray thee as they meet in Spain and in France and in Portugal. Thank thee, Lord, for these the European congregations. We pray that thou would remember and bless thy cause in Sri Lanka, 
Bless Partipan. Remember him, Lord, we pray thee, as we hope he will come to Scotland at the assembly time. Remember thy bre- thy, our brethren in America, in the United States Presbytery, in Canada, in Smith's Falls Congregation. Remember, O oh Lord, we pray thee the work still of Covenant College and of Hudson Taylor Ministries. We ask thee, Lord, that we might be yearning for fruit from these things and be faithful in bringing before thee, our God, the works and the labors of thy servants upon the earth. Remember the work of Abiel Sela in CWI as he continues to bear witness to thee in Jerusalem. And ask thee, Lord, that as he hopes to come amongst us next week, that thou wouldst prepare our hearts for thy truth and delight in the gospel that is prefigured even in the Passover. Remember us now, Lord, as we turn to the scriptures in the singing of them and then in the reading of them. We might delight in having thy truth in our own language, set not only in prose but in poetry, in song that we might sing it. Help us to delight at our privileges, but not to take them for granted, but to use them to thy glory upon the earth. So be with us, take away iniquity and sin, and hear us all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us now turn to Psalm number 148, singing in the second version of the psalm, Psalm 148, the second version Singing together from verse 7 to 14. Psalm 148, the second version. Praise God from earth below, ye dragons and ye deeps. Fire, hail, clouds, wind and snow, whom in command he keeps. Praise ye his name, hills great and small, trees low and tall, beasts wild and tame. So on, Psalm 148 then, from verse 7, praise God from earth below. Praise God from earth below, ye dragons and ye deeps, fire, hail, clouds, wind and snow, whom in command he Praise ye his name, hills great and small, trees low and tall, peace wild and tame. All things that creep or fly, ye kings, ye vulgar throng, all princes mean or high, both men and virgins young, him young and old, exalt his name, for much his fame should be extolled. Oh, let God's name be praised above both earth and sky. For he has sent a race and set their horn on high. In Lord's land be of Israel's race near to his grace. La Lord praise ye. Let's now read God's word together in the Old Testament and in the book of Genesis, chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, we'll take up the reading from verse 37.
Genesis 41, 37. Let us hear God's word. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, as a suggestion that Joseph has made of how to deal with the coming famine. And in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand. And arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Panea. And he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field which was round about every city laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, but it was without number. And Joseph, and unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you do. The famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. All, and all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn. Because of the famine was sore in all lands. Amen. May God's blessing then rest upon that reading of his infallible and inspired truth. We'll sing now in Psalm 105. Psalm 105, singing from verse 16 down to verse 22. Six stanzas. Psalm 105, 16 to 22. He called for famine on the land and break the staff of bread, but yet he sent a man before by whom they should be fed, even Joseph, whom I'm naturally sell for a slave the day whose feet with fetters they did hurt, and he in irons lay, until the time that his word came to give him liberty, the word and purpose of the Lord did him in prison try. Psalm 105, 16 to 22. He called for famine on the land, he bricked up of bread, but yet he sent a man before by whom they should be fed. If Joseph, whom I naturally sell for a Whose feet with fetters laid her 
heart until night on sleep until the time let his word came to give him liberty the word and purpose of the Lord did him in prison try. Lend sent the king and did command that he should be he let the people's ruler was did send to set him free a lord to rule his family he raised him as most fit to him of all that he possessed. He did the charge commit. That he might at his pleasure bind the princess of the land, and he might teach his senators. A wisdom to understand. Well, then let us turn now to the section we read in Genesis 41, and we'll take as our text the words of verse 38. Genesis 41, and taking as our text the words of verse 38. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such an one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? Can we find such a one as this is? After the um, break of our communion season last Lord's Day, we return this week to our study on the life of Joseph. And we already spent two weeks on this uh, chapter, and tonight will be our third and final look at chapter 41. First of all, we noticed God's revelation to Pharaoh by means of this dream. And then a fortnight ago, we considered God's salvation to Egypt. And then in our third part this evening of this chapter, we have the heading of the exaltation of Joseph. God's exaltation of Joseph. Now you remember the dreams of Pharaoh. The children here remember them as well from the Sabbath school teaching, no doubt. The seven fat cows that were swallowed up by the seven thin cows. The next dream, seven full, ripe, and uh, goodly ears of corn consumed by seven blasted and thin ears of corn. What did it mean? Nobody in Egypt could tell Pharaoh what it meant. None of his wise men or astrologers. And then the butler finally remembered about Joseph. And Joseph was summoned from prison to interpret the dreams. And he explained to Pharaoh that God had been warning him by means of these dreams about a terrible seven-year-long famine that was coming. And it would come after seven years of plenty. And after Pharaoh heard Joseph interpret the dreams and also propose the solution 
to this coming crisis, the famine. Pharaoh then asks of his courtiers a very shrewd question. And it's here in the text. Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And that question, friends, is the one I want to have ringing, as it were, in our hearts as we go through this section this evening of God's Word. I hope that we can see where we're applying the question, particularly, of course, not to Joseph in the Old Testament, but to Jesus in the New. When we ask, can we find such a one as this is? Can we find anyone better than Jesus? And, of course, to ask the question is to answer it. Let us look then at this passage, at the exaltation of Joseph. And first of all, we can say Joseph is exalted for his humility. He is exalted for his humility because throughout this chapter, we finally see Joseph lifted out of the sheer misery of the last years of his life, and particularly the more recent years he has served in prison. Many long years he has been in that dungeon, exactly how many we don't know. But finally, he is to meet the king of Egypt. And by the end of the chapter, we know he has risen to the rank of second only to Pharaoh himself. It's an astonishing rise and elevation for this uh, Hebrew prisoner. But what then accounts for this meteoric promotion? I would suggest that one part of that answer lies in uh, Joseph's humility. Joseph's humility. At no point is there any question of Joseph exalting himself. He does not promote himself. He is promoted and exalted by Pharaoh. And if you remember right back to near the start of our study, this was at least a question, it was almost like a fly in the ointment when he was a younger man, when he dreamed the other two dreams at the start of it all about his sheaf standing up and his brother's sheaves bowing down to him and how he was being bowed down to in the second dream even by the sun and the moon and the stars. And at that point, we at least forced to ask the question, though we don't think necessarily it was there, but we're forced to ask the question, what kind of a man is this? Is he arrogant? Is he proud? Is he advancing his own cause? Well, it is absolutely clear in this passage that Joseph made no effort whatsoever to promote himself. Time and again in the passage, he is at pains to point out the true source of this interpretation that he's been given. It is of God. God is the one who is making this known to Pharaoh. God is the one who is revealing this to Pharaoh to give him warning. Listen to Joseph speak in verse uh, 16 of this chapter. We didn't have time to read all the way back to verse 16. But in verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Down at verse 25. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Again in verse 28. This is a thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. And again in verse 32. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Notice how... This is not just mumbled under Joseph's breath. Oh, by the way, it's God who's doing all this. He was upfront. He was emphatic. He was blunt about it. And the point isn't lost on Pharaoh. Look at verse 38. Can we find such a one as this is? A man in whom the Spirit of God is. He's picked up on it. Look at verse 39. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all these, all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Joseph, a man down in the lowest part of society, taken from the dungeon of Pharaoh, 
reminds us of the prophecy of the words of the prophecy of Isaiah, famously in Isaiah 53, speaking of Christ, of course, but he was taken from prison and from judgment. Now, I don't think any of us would begrudge Joseph his elevation. We know from our study what he's been through and how it must have been painful, how it must have been miserable. He was hated by his own brothers, enough for them to throw him into a pit, ignore his cries for help, plot to murder him, and in the end, greed takes over, and instead they sell him as a slave. He is taken hundreds of miles away. He is sold as a slave. He is diligently working when he is accosted and lied about and unjustly imprisoned. He is languishing in the prison for years. There seems to be an opportunity to escape, and the one whom he helps forgets about him for another two years. This is no longer the young strip of a lad who had gone down to find out how his brothers had get on with the herd of his father. Under his father's care, as his father's favorite, certainly, but as a young lad. No, this man is now 30 years old. And I think it is noticeable to Pharaoh, and I think it attracts Pharaoh. Here's someone not out for personal gain. You can imagine, as, they, as today, so then, those around the highest in the land tend to be out for themselves, tend to always have an angle, tend to always be seeking self-promotion, but not this young Hebrew prisoner. He is self-effacing and God-promoting. He is at pains to avoid anything that would be counted as self-promotion. Perhaps in that way, he has learned his early experiences. And even this really clueless, ignorant, heathen king recognizes in Joseph the qualities that would make a very suitable second in command. And this offers us also our best view of the exalted Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we were pondering a bit in the morning, for those of you who are here, it was in looking first at his humiliation last week that we are better placed to see the grandeur of his exaltation this week. It is in seeing the misery of the cross and the suffering of the Savior that we are therefore able <coughs> to have a right perspective on the majesty of him sitting on the throne of heaven. If Joseph was humbled, and he was, even still, it was as a sinful man amongst sinful men. But the Savior, <coughs> as God became man, took on himself our nature in the likeness of sinful flesh, yet without sin, he was derided. He was disliked. He was disbelieved. He was rejected and mocked. He was betrayed. He was denied. He was forsaken. He was beaten. He was condemned. He was nailed and crucified and derided some more. He was killed. What an exaltation it is then when he is given the throne of the universe. The one under the condemnation of men is offered the highest seat in all of heaven. But notice how the one sets the stage for the other. It is not only a contrast but with Jesus, it is his humiliation that earns him his exaltation. It is his cross that wins him his crown. And so look at the Joseph of the New Testament, as we were hearing last Sabbath morning in the table addresses, and see there both the Lamb of God as it had been slain and the Lion of the tribe of Judah. See in him the humiliation and the exaltation. 
Where else can you see such a suitable Savior? Can we find anyone else like Jesus? Can we find such a one as this? Secondly, Joseph is exalted for his plan of salvation. He's exalted for his humility, but he's also exalted for his plan of salvation. The next grounds of Joseph's elevation would seem to be not only his humility, but his wisdom. He not only points out that there's a problem coming and correctly interprets the dream, but he is able to provide a very suitable, sensible, practical solution. He doesn't only say, oh, by the way, there's a terrible famine coming. coming. He is able to propose how to avoid tragedy. He provides salvation. Notice how this put in verse 39. For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Now Joseph's plan is simple enough, at least once we hear about it, it seems simple enough. Whether any of us would have thought of it without Joseph's plain, simple suggestion is, I think, doubtful. We might be tempted to think it's not really dif difficult to figure out what needed to be done here. There were seven years of plenty. Well, surely the obvious thing is to do what Joseph suggested. But it's always easy once you get given the answer. And Joseph knows not just what to do, but how to go about it. The general idea of saving up and putting a little by in the good years seems wise. But how much will we need? How much is going to be enough? How much should we save up? Who can tell? Who could have suggested the right proportion of that? Well, in this case, Joseph could tell. One fifth part of corn in the good years would be sufficient and ample to sustain them through the bad years. And it is as much for this plan that he proposes as for any other reason that Joseph finds himself propelled and catapulted, as it were, to the forefront of Egyptian society, to be promoted to the highest rank in the land, bar the king himself. I should say here, perhaps, that the word in verse 39, discreet, in this context, it means discerning or understa of understanding. Today, when we speak about someone being discreet, we mean something slightly different usually. We mean someone maybe who can keep a secret, someone who's very quiet, someone who doesn't draw attention to themselves, who can be trusted not to blurt something out that ought to be kept private. But discreet in this context means a man of wisdom and understanding. In other words, even this godless Egyptian king can see in Joseph that he has put forward a very sensible, doable plan. And it suits the needs of the situation and a coming famine. Pharaoh looks at it. He hears it. He can't find anything wrong with it. He cannot pick any holes in it. He cannot see any need even to try and improve upon it. How many times a perfectly good idea has been ruined by revising it and reworking it and reshaping it and remolding it. And by the end, what you've got is something that's a thousand miles away from the original good idea and you've lost the good idea in all the revisions. Think of a painter who has labored long and hard over what is to be his masterpiece. And every stroke is done with intent and thought. And the colors are perfectly capturing his subject. And all is beautifully set. And he tries to add just one more stroke of the brush. And he ruins it all. Pharaoh resists the temptation for him to add in any of his own suggestions, to put anything on top of Joseph's plan, he realizes that to do so would be folly. This plan he knew was from God. This young man was discreet and wise. There was no need to change a single word of all that Joseph proposed. And this we see the cause for his exaltation it was because he put forward this plan of salvation that he was elevated. And in this, we see the cause for the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
His plan of salvation is also a perfect plan. His plan was to come in our nature, to take our nature to himself in order that he might represent us fully, that he might be able to be the covenant head of men and women and boys and girls. He planned to keep God's law perfectly. So he put himself under that law in order to keep it because the law had been broken by every man who'd ever come into the world since Adam. But he was going to keep it perfectly so that he could provide a righteousness for men and women. And then he also proposed that he would not only provide a righteousness, but he would also deal with the other problem, which was the wrath of God abiding upon us for our sin. That he would exhaust the wrath of God, bear and take away the wrath of God for sinners. He would then rise from the dead to prove not only that he had been dead, but that he was now victorious over death and the grave. He would ascend up to heaven so that he could then send down his spirit to empower his church on the earth to advance and to grow and to develop while securing at the same time his church from all the attacks of the enemies. Christ then proposed that he will return at the last day when his church will be perfected and claim her as his bride, and they will be together forever. The perfection of the proposed salvation of Christ. It is a perfect plan. And friend here tonight, where can you find anyone else with a perfect plan to forgive you of all your sins, to take away all your iniquity, to give you acceptance with God in heaven, and reconcile you to God? Where can you find someone who will love you forever and save you forever and keep you out of hell forever and bring you into heaven forever? Where can you find someone who is proposing such a wonderful plan of salvation? Can you find such a one? Can you find anyone else like that tonight? Surely if you could find someone who could give you all that you needed, you would never let him go. Joseph is exalted for the plan of salvation, but he is also thirdly exalted for the provision of salvation. He didn't just plan it, he did it. That's what happened for Joseph. Notice that Joseph is exalted for more than just the planning. He's not just the theory man who sits behind the desk. He's a person who gets on the overalls and goes out to to do because there comes next seven years of plenty and the land is bringing forth by handfuls i remember hearing my uh the retired minister john, reverend john morrison who was in uh, staffen and in shawbust uh, speaking about his youth in scalpy when there was such an abundance of fish in the sea he said you could put your hand in at scalpy pier and come away with a heavy it was producing by handfuls the sea. Well, that's how it was in the days of the seven years of plenty. But sure enough, as day follows night, came the day when the famine began. And in verse 54, we read of the seven years of dearth beginning to come. And the people soon enough began to waste away their reserves and their cupboards get, got barer and barer. And all that stored up in the good years in their own homes began to run out. And they began to cry out. They were famished. And they began to cry out to Pharaoh for bread. And listen to the words of Pharaoh, the great king of Egypt. Verse 55. Go unto Joseph. Go unto Joseph, all oh, friends. What wonderful words these are. Go unto Joseph. Joseph has plenty. Joseph has the key to the storehouses. Joseph has made sure there's ample in all the land. 
Joseph has provided for you. Joseph will not leave you to starve. Go unto Joseph. Let that be our appeal to you this evening. Dear lost soul, go unto Jesus. Go unto Jesus. In the needs that you have. In the hunger that you have. In the thirst that you have. Go unto Jesus. Are you hungry tonight? Hungry for mercy because you're aware of your sin. Aware that you're missing things in this world. Aware that there's an emptiness in all that you've had. Are you starving tonight? Starving for pardon because you have a guilty conscience that will not let you go? Are you someone who is a slave to sin and you can't get free of it? And you need to be bought out of this misery, this slavery. You need to be redeemed. Are you in need of redemption tonight? Go on to Joseph. Go on to Jesus. Jesus has what you need. Jesus will meet all your needs. Jesus has been preparing and planning and providing for this very moment in your life. Go on to Jesus. This moment in your life when you have run out of your plenty, this moment in your experience where you have nothing left that you can turn to that will feed you, that will satisfy you, and you are famished. When you've nothing left to give and nowhere else to go, go on to Jesus. Verse 56. Joseph opened all the storehouses. Oh, friend, let me plead with you tonight. Let me beseech you, delay no more. Don't put it off for another second, for another day, for another hour. Go on to the Lord. Don't hold back from him. What are you in need of? What are you without in this world? What do you not have? Jesus has full stores. Everything that you need, he has. Do you need repentance? He can give it to you. Do you need faith in the Lord Jesus? He has it in store. Go on to Jesus. You know when you try to order something and something that says not in stock? Jesus never says that. What do you need? What do you need? He has it. He is sure to have it. He most certainly has provided. It's in his storehouses. Go unto Jesus. Do you need assurance? Do you need comfort? Go unto Jesus. You need to be released from the claws of conviction of sin. Go unto Jesus. Do you need to escape from the torment of despair that fills your soul? Go on to Jesus. You might have the cry of the Apostle Paul. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? His answer is the New Testament equivalent of go on to Joseph. His answer is, I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. He will deliver me from the body of this death. Go on to Jesus. Are you afraid of death? Go on to Jesus. Are you afraid of failure if you were to begin as a Christian? Go on to Jesus. Does hell freeze your heart with terror? Go on to Jesus. Is there some particular sin that you cannot conquer? You have tried to best it and you cannot. Go on to Jesus. Is there a pride and a stubbornness of your heart? So you've been long resisting the beseeching entreaties of the gospel. How long have you been scraping the bottom of the barrel? Trying to find a little bit more from the years of plenty that you once knew. And there's nothing left, but you're still scraping the barrel when you should be going to Jesus. You're still looking at the, the husks that feed the swine rather than going to your father. Go on to Jesus. What can you do now? Only one thing. Go unto Jesus. And what he says to you, do. Go unto Joseph, is what Pharaoh says. And the people of Egypt went unto Joseph. Here's a heathen nation. And they went to God's appointed savior. Uncircumcised Egyptians. And they went to Joseph. And they listened to Joseph. And they loved Joseph. 
Joseph would never leave them starving. Joseph opened up these great storehouses. Joseph made sure that there was food enough for all of them. Joseph tended to them in all their needs. You can imagine the way it was. They get hungry. They send word to Pharaoh, cried out, we're famished. He says, go to Joseph. Some go straight away. Some are a bit unsure, but they go anyway in the second wave. Others are holding back and they're not sure about this. Go to Joseph. Wasn't he the prisoner? Wasn't he in the dungeon? Don't we hear bad things about him? Wasn't he an immoral man? Wasn't he a filthy man? They wait for others to come back, wouldn't they? That would be the natural thing to do. Even if they're a bit skeptical, they would at least ask the others who first went to Joseph and they would say, how did it go? How did you get on? What would they say? What would they tell them? Oh, you have to go. He's got storehouses full of grain. And he gave us everything we needed. And he told us to come back when we need more. Go unto Joseph. Surely thou be sensible. Even in spiritual matters above all, if you're unsure about this yourself, will you not at least ask others who've tried it? Who've been in the same place that you're in, needing the same food that you need, the same life from God that you need, won't you ask them? who have already gone to Joseph, should I go? Will he receive me? Will he give to me what he gave to you? There isn't a Christian in all the world who would say anything other. And you do not need to worry. Go. Don't stay any longer starving. Don't eat the filth. Go. Go for the sake of your soul that never dies. Go. While there is time, go while you have wits and strength. Go while there's today before the evil days come. Go while you are still on mercy's ground. Go. They would say what the Bible says. They would say, I went to Jesus and he saved me. He opened all the store. They would say he is willing and he is ready to do the same for you. If you come to him, do you notice what Pharaoh said? Go unto Joseph. They had to go. Go unto Jesus. Do not hold back. Do not wait and say, oh, well, maybe he will come and find me. I'll just sit here where I am. I won't go. I won't obey. I'll just wait and see. Go. Is the requirement. Go is the command. Go to him. Ask him to save you. Do not let stubborn pride hold you back any longer. You see, there's no greater way for a sinner to exalt Jesus than by asking him to be your savior. To save you from all your sins. He has come. He took our nature. He kept the law. Made under the law that we broke. He didn't break it. Even though he was tempted as no man ever before him was tempted. He kept it. Without sin. Pilate found no fault in this man. He went forward from there to the cross. He died in our room and in our stead. The just for the unjust. He rose again for our justification. That we might be justified to trust in him. And he has sent his spirit into his church. And sinners are still being supernaturally saved. 2,000 years later by the power of that spirit that he sent into his church. Oh, what a perfect plan. And he'll come again. And we await his return. Can we not exalt him for a perfect provision of salvation? Time is nearly past, but a few more things briefly. Fourthly, Joseph is exalted in his promotion. I want to notice just quickly and 
putting them all together in this point, the ways that Joseph was exalted that come along, if you like, with this promotion that he has. First of all came power and authority in verse 40. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Joseph was given power and authority, real authority, to deal with things in Egypt. And Jesus is exalted in power and authority, and he rules God's people according to his own authority. God has given it to him. Notice he's exalted in his splendor in verse 42. Pharaoh takes off his ring from his hand and puts it on Joseph's hand and arrays him in vestures of fine linen with a gold chain about his neck, a symbol of his authority, like the mayor's chain. So Jesus, too, has been exalted into splendor. Gone now forever is the likeness of sinful flesh. Gone is the pain that he endured. Gone is the bloody smear across his head from the sweating great drops of blood or the puncture wounds of the crown of thorns. He is promoted and he wears the symbols of God's authority. God's ring, as it were, is upon his finger. He is ruling with the authority of God. His word is endorsed by God. His proposals to sinners, the gospel is proclaimed, are counted in every sense as the words of God himself. Just as when Joseph spoke, he spoke with the authority of Pharaoh. So when Jesus appeals to sinners in the gospel, it is God's word. It's the exaltation of Jesus. There's also a declaration evidencing the exaltation of Joseph. Notice that in verse 43. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. He was given a chariot. There were criers who went before him, commanding people, bow the knee. Such is the way with Jesus. Tonight, the Lord Jesus has heralds going before his gospel chariot, all encircling the globe. He has them. They go before him, crying, bow the knee. We are seeking out those who will bow the knee to Jesus. We are watching for those who will bow the knee tonight to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will submit and show loyalty to the Joseph of the New Testament. And we beseech you tonight for the good of your own soul and for the glory of this master whom I serve. Bow the knee. Joseph had his chariot and Joseph had criers go before him. Jesus, however, is born, if you like, on the words of a hundred thousand witnesses and preachers tonight calling for sinners to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You can see Joseph is exalted as well by the status of his marriage to the priest of On's daughter, a high-ranking marriage and considerable proof of the great esteem with which Pharaoh held Joseph, that he would give him to such a high-ranking family. You don't need to distract, I don't think, by questions here that might arise about was it a good marriage? Was it unequally yoked? The purpose of the recording it here in Scripture is to show how greatly Joseph was elevated in Egyptian society. And here's somewhere we don't necessarily compare. We can contrast Joseph with Jesus. What nobility, if you like, what high-ranking family status does Christ win? No. What eminently suitable family of impeccable stock does he wed into? No. His heart is set on sinners. He counts the poor and the needy as his prize. The filthy and the broken are his treasures. And yet this shows, I think, the greater exaltation still of Jesus than any Joseph. Because God grants him that request. He is so highly esteemed, so greatly exalted, so fully respected by his father. He is free to marry even someone so far beneath him, even of such lowly stock as sinners in the gospel. What is also his jurisdiction in verse 46. We had time to look at that. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Or in verse 57, because the famine was sowed in all lands, all countries came unto Egypt to Joseph. 
Savior has given all the world his jurisdiction for his kingdom to go with authority to proclaim and propose mercy and peace and redemption goes to all the world. And that, of course, we can conclude with the generation here. His reasons of his exaltation. In verse 50, we are told about his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Their names are quite remarkable. God has made me forget all my toil. And God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. These are the precious names with which Joseph calls his children. But are they not suitable for Jesus to call his children by these same names? His dearly beloved little ones. They make him forget all his toil. It's not the case when he brings in a sinner. They make him forget all his toil. And they make him fruitful in the land wherein he was afflicted. This earth that pummeled our Savior, bruised him, beat him, scourged him, crucified him, rejected him, hated him, killed him. This land is producing fruit in the land of his affliction by the children who are born to Christ. Oh, the exaltation of Christ. And that just as a concluding point, fifthly and very briefly, Joseph is exalted for his uniqueness. Can we find such a one? Come back to this, friends. Verse 38. Can we find such a one? Come back to the question and the accompanying statement by, jo by Pharaoh in verse 55. Go unto Joseph. Can we find anyone else? No. Therefore, go unto Joseph because he is unique. Pharaoh doesn't send his needy people to anyone else. He doesn't waste their time. Go to Joseph. Go only to Joseph. Go always to Joseph. Joseph is unique. He is able to save to the uttermost the famished masses of Egypt. But if that is so, and it accounts in great measure for the exaltation of Joseph, that he was able to do this, how much more so should it give us cause to have the exaltation of Christ before us? Because what does God say to us on every page of the Bible? What does he say to every struggling sinner in this world? Go on to Jesus. Can we find such a one as he? There is none else like him. No one else can save. No one else who can sympathize with the sinner. No one else who can enter into your sorrows like he can enter in. No one else who's a sympathetic high priest. No one else able to be touched with the feeling of your infirmities. No one else who is an all points tempted like as you are. No one else who is a beloved son of God. No one else who's made ample store in his death in order to be able to freely offer you life. No one else who exalted the wrath of God so that he might bring sinners before his father, reconciled to his father. We preach Jesus. We preach Christ crucified. And we love to do so. But we also do it out of the sheer necessity of it. There is no one else to preach. There is no other savior. There is no other name given amongst men whereby ye must be saved. And that exalts the Lord because he alone is proposed to you tonight as your Savior once again. Go unto Jesus. May he bless his word. Let us pray. Lord, our God, we thank thee that there is but one Savior. We thank thee you are not left with the confusion of deciding Amongst many, which one will be the real Savior? Which one will be the best Savior? Which one will give us the most advantage? There is only one. And he is all that any of us ever need. May we tonight be given that grace of heart and soul whereby we would go unto Jesus. And ask him to open all his store for us. Give us faith to believe. The Lord Jesus will do that when we ask him. In his name, 
Amen. Our closing psalm of praise in a few stands at the end of Psalm 110. The last three stanzas from verse 5 to 7. Psalm 110, verse 5 to 7. The glorious and mighty Lord that sits at thy right hand shall in his day of wrath strike through kings that do him withstand. He shall among the heathen judge. He shall with bodies dead the places fill. O'er many lands he wound shall every head. The brook that runneth in the way with drink shall him supply. And for this cause and triumph he shall lift his head on high. Psalm 110, 5 to 7. La glorious and mighty Lord, Lord sits at thy right hand, shall in his day of wrath strike through kings that do him withstand. He shall among the heathen judge, he shall with bodies dead the places fill o'er many Intimations. The uh, Ladies' Fellowship is in the Manses Tuesday morning at 10.30. The prayer meeting on Wednesday, as usual, at 7.30, and after that, a meeting of the Deacon's Court. The Scalpy Communion season begins this Thursday, running through to Monday. On Thursday, Reverend uh, Ian Smith is assisting. On Friday, Reverend John McLeod, and thereafter, Reverend James Gracie. And if you are able to support them in presence, in person, and in prayer, would encourage you please to do the service of next Lord's Day at the usual times, uh, 12 and 6 with the Sabbath school at 5.40. These services will be conducted by Reverend Ian Smith, tired, I expect to be on supply uh, at communion season rather in Inverness. The building and fabric fund action will also be taken after both services next Lord's Day. And then notice a week on Thursday, we hope to be hosting here in our own church a uh, visit by Mr. Aviel Sela of uh, what used to be known as CWI, Christian Witness to Israel, now known as International Mission to Jewish People. That's a week on Thursday at 7.30, where you hope to be hearing about the gospel in the Passover from Mr. Sela. And I would encourage you to come yourselves and to invite others along that evening. These, I think, are all the intimations at this time, and they are, as ever, subject to God's will. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost rest on and abide with you all, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>